hey, good to see you. So PowerShell 7.2, the LTS, the long-term service release, is just a few months away, planned for November. What a great time to do a series of episodes of the show to introduce you to the new and the enhanced capabilities of PowerShell, like predictive intelligence to help guide your way, things like secrets management to better secure your automation, and of course, one of my favorites, Crescendo, to make native commands work more like PowerShell commandlets. But to start this series, I got a chance to sit down with Jeffrey Snover. Now, technical fellow at Microsoft and the inventor of PowerShell. Uh, but I wanted to ask him a st about a story in this book. This book, Shell of an Idea, The Untold Story of PowerShell by Don Jones. Hey, do you know Don Jones? He's a prolific contributor to the PowerShell community, along with his friend Jeff Hicks that wrote the infamous series of Learn PowerShell in a Month of Lunches. He's also known as Jeffrey's first follower, and he's got great inside stories never heard before. And one of them is about dead objects versus live. And that's where this story begins. I'm starting to show Jeffrey live local objects and grabbing objects remotely that are dead and the confusion that wraps around them. And check out Jeffrey's story and his explanation. So without much further ado, got to grab my hat, get ready for objects dead or alive. So let me share my screen. I've got uh, our, our latest build of PowerShell 7, and this is something that's it's been around. I'm going to make a variable, and I'm going to, oh, thanks, predictor. So I'm going to run get process. I'm just going to grab a process, win log on, and what I want to take a look at is its properties and its methods. And if I, if I take a look at dollar sign $A, there's the process. And if I go out, and I'm just going to send this to uh, get member, or GM, I have what I expect. I've got the, the list of properties that I expect. And more importantly, and this is what I want to highlight, I have this method kill. So I can kill the process. And what's kind of cool about that is, I mean, I could literally just type kill. I'm not going to do it, of course, but um, and it would work. However, what I ran into and what um, you know, objects, dead or alive, are all about, I'm going to do this to a remote system. And yeah. uh, so I'm going to uh -huh. hit my uh, uh, server core. I'm going to run the same thing. And this is what is, seems kind of inconsistent to me, is I'm going to get this back, dollar sign $B. It's exactly what I expect, the win logon. I'm going to go in. I'm going to take a look at it because maybe I want to kill this. And I get a list of properties, but n there's 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 no methods. The yeah, methods are all gone. And and so, <laughs> it, the, I, I got to be honest with you. This uh, you know PowerShell strives for consistency, and and when I go across remoting, I'm losing my methods. I, I this seems a little inconsistent, right? Yeah, indeed. And that inconsistency is what saved PowerShell. <laughs> you know, we had, whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> How can the inconsistency save PowerShell? Well, if you recall in the book, we talk about how, you know, basically PowerShell was under attack. There was a group of people in Windows that just wanted to kill it one way or the other. And they kept trying and we were, you know, we were like a cockroach in a kitchen full of cowboys. And they kept trying to stomp up. So we just kept scurrying. And then finally, they thought they got us cornered, right? inconsistent objects. Look at that, that ex very example. And they had a review and they're gonna show us to show this inconsistency to Bill Gates. And like, Bill, this PowerShell's terrible. It's inconsistent. And Bill's like, what? And he explained it just as you did. And he said, and like, so we should kill this. And I said, well, no, actually, inconsistency is great. And all of a sudden, like, what the hell? Who is this guy? Inconsistency is great. <laughs> well, I got their attention, right? Inconsistency is great. I said, why is inconsistency great? I said, because, you know, uh, uh, I'm getting older, okay? And so now I am, uh, I've got a pair of glasses for reading and I got a pair of glasses for using the computer, right? So, I, and there I, got, I can read the computer and then when I read, I put these on. I said, and so each lens is consistent but because I deal with some things locally and then I deal with some things remotely, I'm spending all day going back and forth between tools, okay? But each each tool is consistent. I said, but last week, I just got these amazing things. I don't know if you can see this, but these are bifocals and these are actually trifocals. Oh. I got older since then. But there's a line <laughs> in the middle of this lens. This is an inconsistent tool, 
It's an inconsistent tool. One lens at the top, one lens at the bottom. But when I put it on, all of a sudden, the first time I did that, I said, oh, wait, they're inconsistent. There's this line here. But then this inconsistency allowed me to like look at the screen, look at my read something, look at the screen, look at something. And it just transformed my daily experience. That inconsistency, inconsistent tool gave me a consistent experience. There is a line, there is a difference, and you need to know when, but then all of a sudden it provides you this wonderful, consistent experience. You know what, I think you really dial it in when you say the inconsistent tool gives me a consistent experience. So what you're basically saying is, is that whether an object is live or dead, it's helping me be more productive without having to think or worry about it or deal with it so that the inconsistent tool makes it my experience more consistent and quicker. Yeah, quite honestly. Exactly. Well, yeah, the inconsistent you... objects give you allow your tools and your scripts to be consistent, as opposed to saying, "Oh, I got one way to do it this way and another way to do it that way." Let me show you some examples. So, yeah, as a matter of fact, I was just about to ask if you could show an example because I really love to know more. All right, so let me show you share my screen with you. Okay, so let's do this live. I'm gonna get service, okay? And then okay. I'm gonna do a remote session. Okay, so now I connect, create a local SSH connection. And when I'm gonna, oh. Okay, so now I'll get a dead object, okay? Okay, so now I've got dollar sign live. And this is the one from your local box. And this is the one for remote, okay? Now okay, they look it. very similar, right? Yeah, okay. they look the same. Okay, but let's take a look at the, the properties, right? I'll sign live through format list star, show all the properties. Okay, so you see all that, right? Then I'll do dead. And it looks the same. Although if you were a careful observer, you'll notice that the live object has 21 properties, but the dead one has 24. Okay, so uh -huh. there are, a few properties here, here are two of them, um, that are on the dead property. So PS computer name. So basically anytime we get an object from remote, we, we tag it, we put the, where did we get it from? And we get it from a run space ID. This is the, uh, the, the identifier of the session to that remote machine. And so anytime you have an object, like you take a look at some object, like, where'd this thing come from? If it's remote, I can tell you where it came from. Yeah, let me just show you one more thing. Dead, sure. Table name, let's see, name, PS computer table, computer name, PS computer name, PS show computer name, run space ID. There you go. So this was the live object, this first thing. And notice it has name, but it doesn't have these three properties. PS computer name, whether to show gotcha. the computer name or not. Okay, so by the way, so that dead, dead. Notice it shows, when I do dollar sign live, it just gave the first three columns. The last one shows this. You drew a distinction between a live object has method and a dead object doesn't. But in fact, there are more differences. Let me show you this, okay? So let's say, dollar sign live, dollar sign dead, through format table name status. Okay, it looks the same, right? Looks the same. But they're not. Okay, check this out. In particular, I'm gonna do get member on the status. Now notice on the live object, Status is a property that is a system process, service process, server controller status. Whereas here on the dead object, it's a string. Okay, now here is the heart of it. Here's the heart of it. Consider the case where you're an admin and you're managing uh, an exchange server, a remote exchange server, okay? Mm -hmm. Now, in order for a property to be of a type system, service process, service controller status, it has to have the code for that, okay? Wait, 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 wait. It has to have the code for, well, that kind of makes sense because if I want to execute methods and things like that, I need yeah, the it's, code. It's, it's the type, that. right? Yeah, the type. it's the thing, yeah. 
type is basically uh, the code for that object. Okay, so now imagine again, you're your server admin and you want to manage a remote uh, exchange server. When you go get an exchange object and you bring it back to your laptop, what are you going to have? And let's say, oh, it should be a live object. It should be an exchange object. In order for it to be an exchange object, you'd have to have the exchange code on your laptop. In other words, you would have to install exchange on your laptop. But look, wait, look, it gets look, worse. I've installed exchange. That's not a quick install. It gets worse. Imagine you're on your laptop and you're managing two exchange services and they're different versions. Then All the, the time when I migrate. Exactly. Then when you want to um, uh, manage, if you want live objects locally, you'd have to install Exchange, two versions of Exchange on your laptop. <laughs> one, one version's not good enough. And of course, Exchange won't even allow you to do that. So it's metaphysically impossible to do that. So this is why we say the live object is where the live object is. And then when we bring it locally, we turn it into this dead object, which is basically uh, a proxy object for the, the live object or snapshot, if you will. Well, let me ask you this, though. I mean, if and that makes that makes that makes a lot of sense. And it's actually kind of scary having to have multiple versions of, of, of code on my system in order to be able to uh, uh, play with the objects. So since it doesn't make sense to install code on my box and all that kind of thing, why isn't everything just a dead object? I mean, why don't we have all dead objects? Excellent question. Uh, and the answer is that we wanted to, well, here, let me give you another example. I'll sign live through, sign through. Number type, number type. As you say, you've got methods, right? So with this, yeah. I can say dollar sign live dot start and start that thing. Okay, simple as that. And by the way, it's it's right. it happens immediately. If I wanted to do that to the remote object, what I'd have to do is I'd say dollar sign dead type two invoke command dollar sign input pipe to stop process. Okay, so basically that's what you have to do. So you take the object, you gotta send it across a connection, you send all the properties, and then you pipe it to uh, the object over there. So it's very heavy weight. Uh, anyway, so what we wanted to do, if you recall, we wanted to um, uh, build GUIs on top of PowerShell. In order for a GUI to run on top of PowerShell, it needed to be very, very fast, very, very lightweight. And that's why we wanted to have the live objects. Now, there's another way to tell if you have uh, a live object or a dead object, and that is oh, live.ps type names. PS type names is a property on every single PowerShell object, and it shows you the type hierarchy for that object. Okay, so this says I've got a system.object, it's a Marshall by ref, it's a component object component, and it is a service control. Service control. And then yeah. we go and we add a series of synthetic type names on top of this. So PowerShell synthetically uh, enhances the type system. There are reasons for that. It allows you to bind objects at different levels of the type hierarchy. But now let's take a look at what happens when I do the same thing to the dead object. Now notice system.object, but in front of it is deserialized. So what you see yeah. here is you see this type hierarchy is the same as that type hierarchy, but with deserialized in front of it. And again, the same reason is that when you have formatters and such, it says, oh, when I get an object, how do I format? Do I format it as a table? Do I format it as a, um, a, a list, whatever? Uh, typically, you identify the, the object that you want formatted. And so you say, oh, uh, uh, service controller is formatted this way. And you say service controller or deserialized service controller. Now that you've kind of explained it, it makes a lot of sense. Working locally, I have all of the code, all of the applications, all of the things that I need in order for me to ask those applications to execute methods or show me properties. In remoting, I obviously don't have that code. So 
in the mind of a PowerShell user, when you're doing things to a remote system, you just always want to keep doing it to the remote system is like you showed. If I want to get a process, I can get it remotely. If I want to stop it, I just invoke that stop remotely as well. In other words, work where the code, where that actual product is. And it's pretty simple then at that point. And you get all of the features of both live and dead objects. You got it exactly. And so the model, conceptual model you want to have is you have this islands of rich live objects connected by a sea of this interconnected uh, dead object exchange. You know, all these live and dead objects, but there's one thing that I'll, I'll certainly say about this. You definitely want to read more out of Shell of an Idea by the infamous first follower, Don Jones. Hey, Jeffrey, thanks so much for taking the time to explain that. I appreciate it. Always a pleasure, my friend, always a pleasure.